I've been reading our next guest for a long time and learning from her for a long time. Suzanne Gordon is an award-winning journalist. She's written for most of the major news outlets out there. She's the, also the author of a number of books, and lately she's been writing a lot about a subject that of great importance to me and a lot of people in the country, the Veterans Administration. Her latest book is Wounds of War, How the VA Delivers Health, Healing, and Hope to the nation's veterans, and she is the co-author of a recent article in the American Prospect headlined, uh, Trump's Under the Radar Push to Dismantle Veterans Healthcare, and she joins us now. So first of all, Suzanne, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks for having me, Richard. So you, you've really been covering the VA, the Veterans Administration in depth for a long time, and you understand it well, why should and you know it's been kind of a, pro, a battleground for kind of proxy war between the private and public sector among other things and in your latest piece co-authored with jasper craven uh you talk about something called the mission act and and trump's attempt to uh, undermine i would say uh the foundation of the va why should that be of concern to people well, if you're a veteran, uh, it should, and there's 20 million veterans in America, it should be a huge issue of concern because um, you will lose a healthcare system that understands your needs, your specific needs, and your ex and has expertise in dealing with uh, veterans' very specific uh, problems that were acquired or exacerbated by military service, if not a veteran, you should be very concerned about this because the VA is one of the largest uh, research powerhouses in the country. Uh, thank you, VA, for my shingles vaccine, um, the nicotine patch, uh, the first implantable cardiac pacemaker. The VA teaches 70% of American doctors and 40% of uh, American healthcare professionals. And plus, uh, the VHA also uh, is the really only integrated care system in the country delivering holistic mental health care, physical health care, uh, homeless programs, veterans uh, legal programs, employment programs, and it really is a model for the kind of care that all of us should have. And if they can't kill the VHA, uh, they're really killing a model of care that is a model for our broken healthcare system for people like who aren't veterans like you and me and many others. Well, and I, I think that's such an important point. Uh, but it's, so what mo a lot of people may remember there was a problem with appointment scheduling and so on at the VA, but but uh, overall, throughout its history, its long history in the United States, uh, and you've written about this on a number of occasions, uh, you just enumerated some of the discoveries and breakthroughs as well as the care it's delivering to uh, so many veterans in this country, but it has also, for most of its history, uh, been... I believe, uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, uh, successful in delivering care efficiently, effectively, and compassionately. Is that a fair statement? Well, actually, um, it's gotten better and better. There were points in its history when it wasn't so great. Um, it's always had to play catch up. I mean, people didn't really recognize PTSD, post-traumatic for example. Um, the things that are really important to know about the VHA because you have one system. If veterans are unhappy about something, uh, they can they can organize and petition that one system. It's different than petitioning, you know, five or six thousand individual hospitals. Um, the VHA is also the most transparent healthcare system in the country. It has Congress overseeing. It has um, an Office of Inspector General that in, that gives reports about problems, uh, the government accounting office, you're not going to find that accountability in the private sector. I mean, I had a bad uh, outcome for sur a surgical complication, and you got no help from anybody um, in getting accountability or holding people accountable or getting financial help or anything like that, and that's not true in the VA. So, and, and the VA collects information about problems 
so many veterans that the private sector ha can't, you know, doesn't collect and puts it together. So Agent Orange, burn pit exposure in Iraq, uh, all of this is stuff that we know about because of the VA. So you, you write in your piece, uh, your most recent piece with Jasper Craven, you write uh, that uh, the VA Mission Act, which uh, Donald Trump signed last June, is co commonly considered the biggest overhaul of veterans' health care in a generation, and that the logical conclusion is that it's not, as its boosters claim, something that would shore up the VA for the future and create a veteran-centric system, but would tear down the agency brick by brick visit by visit. What do you mean by that? Well, the VA Mission Act, which was tragically supported overwhelmingly by most Democrats, some courageous Democrats in the House and Senate, like Bernie Sanders, Raul Gravalia, my wonderful congressman, Mark DeSalle, and Nancy Pelosi, uh, opposed it. But uh, it was also lobbied for by many veteran service organizations. And I think uh, people really made an unwise decision in supporting that because what the Mission Act does is give the secretary of the VA, who's appointed by Trump, this is his secret second secretary, uh, David Shulkin was essentially fired because uh, he didn't privatize quickly enough, although I think he privatized quite a bit. Um, and the thing is, the secretary has wide latitude to determine who, which veterans are uh, going to be outsourced to private sector care. And we know that private sector care is less effective, more costly. Private sector providers don't have experience with veterans. And many, many may be pushed into the private sector um, if access standards and eligibility standards are too broad. And everything we've learned, and Jasper Craven and I outlined this in our piece in The American Prospect, everything uh, that we're learning from sources is that the standards that Secretary Wilkie is considering are too broad that they will push so many people out of the Veterans Health Administration into the private sector that uh, you will just see this vast outflux and every dollar that comes that is for private sector care will be taken out of the VHA budget because they have refused, Congress and the President have refused to allocate supplemental funding for the VHA, so that'll starve the VHA of resources. Then comes in 2020, uh, part of the Mission Act is this Asset and Infrastructure Review Commission appointed again by President Trump with many in health industry executives and representatives who are have a huge financial stake in Veterans Health Administration outsourcing, and they will be assessing what facilities to close on the basis of utilization. Well, if you've just sent 63% or more patients to the private sector, you're going to have underutilized facilities, and they'll say, oh my goodness, these facilities are underutilized, they should be closed. I mean, this will be, as we said in the piece, you know, death to the VA, uh, brick by brick, um, uh, visit by visit, and as one VA a uh, medical chief of staff told us, you know, this is kaboom for the VHA. Richard, something that it's really important for people to understand is that patient safety, it depends on patient volume, right? So you don't want to go to a cardiac surgeon who's done, uh, you know, um, uh, 20 cabbages, 20 coronary artery bypass graft um, uh, 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 surgeries. You want someone who's done 10,000. And the only way you can do 10,000 is by having enough patient volume. So you deprive the VA of patients, they lose volume, they lose expertise and skills. And then it's going to be even harder to recruit people be, to the to work in the facility because people don't want to work in a place where they, they can't keep up their skills. And you also have, uh, and again, we're talking to Suzanne Gordon about uh, the Veterans Administration. You also have, of course, the conflict of interest, you alluded to it, uh, of having people uh, decide whether facilities should remain open or be closed, who also will get some of the uh, services uh, that will flip to the private sector when those facilities are closed. So they have every motivation to say, oh, yes, this is underused. We need to close it. And I assume, Suzanne, but correct me if I'm wrong, I assume that one of the ways, because I've dealt with privatization and other issues and reported on it, and including Medicare, by the way, but, but um, 
I assume that one of the ar arguments is being made here is that, well, veterans will, that they'll have a choice that uh, instead of just going to the VA to get their services, they'll be able to choose from a plethora or a variety of, uh, of, uh, providers of insurers. Is that true? Is that one of the arguments? I think what, because um, the Republicans and Trump and Wilkie, et cetera, know that veterans hate privatization, they constantly insist they're not privatizing. And by that, they mean um, that they're not closing the VA tomorrow and firing everybody and selling off uh, every facility. But privatization really is a spectrum of activities that includes starving the system, putting out bad things about the system, bad press about the system, not letting the system tell good stories, et cetera. Um, and you know, the only way, you, and so they've named it choice, not privatization, but the only way you can have a choice is if you give equal resources to both parties in the choice. And if you basically starve and close the VHA, you won't give veterans a choice because they won't have a choice between the choice here is supposed to be between the private sector facilities and the Veterans Health Administration. Well, if you've killed the Veterans Health Administration or destroyed its ability to deliver high quality services by starving it of funds and staff, we have 45,000 unfilled vacancies in the, in the Veterans Health Administration. Then you've eliminated choice. So basically what they're doing is in the name of choice, they're eliminating choice for the 72% or more of veterans who say they want the VHA to be improved and strengthened, not dismantled. Well, and I think that it's also important, uh, that's a great point, and I want to emphasize also that when, when, when pe people talk about choice, quote unquote, in a, in a situation like that, what they're really talking about is the insurance company's ability to pick and choose, they won't tell you this, but to cherry pick the, the people that will be most profitable for them and leave the problem cases to an understarved, to an underfunded. Yeah. And, and so we're, we, we could be looking at a kind of Dickensian outcome for some of the, our veterans who need the, the most help, uh, I would think. Um, well, I, absolutely. And and Wilkie, Secretary Wilkie has said, oh, we'll leave the chronically mentally ill and the homeless and the people who have, you know, chronic rehab, rehabilitation problems, the blind, the people who have spinal cord injuries, you know, people with amputations and traumatic brain injury, we'll let them stay in the VHA. Well, those are exactly the kind of patients that the private sector doesn't want because they're, right. they're, they don't need episodic acute treatments that they can charge a lot of money for. They need labor intensive, uh, chronic long-term care over a lifetime. The private sector does not do that well. The private sector is, is, you know, structured, their business model is structured around providing high cost episodic disease related treatment. Precisely. I, I, I was half expecting, I was thinking when you were we, some are paraphrasing uh, Secretary Wilkie there, I, I was half expecting, you know, the secretary closed by saying of these uh, of these patients, are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? There's just, <laughs> the, it, 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 it's so grim and it's so important that people understand this. So uh, I know you will keep on this story. Uh, where can people go, I assume, re to get to learn more? I assume reading your book would be well, a good know, place to start. Start reading Wounds of War. Uh, you can go to my website, which is SuzanneGordon.com. I'm also a senior policy fellow for the v Veterans Healthcare Policy Institute. That's veteranspolicy.org. I think it's also extremely important for listeners who care about this or who should care about this to reach out to the House Veterans Affairs Committee. And as we said in the article in the American Prospect, um, they should be calling on uh, the chair, Mark Ticano, to be holding hearings on the influence of, of people like the conservative Koch brothers funded uh, concerned veterans for America and, and Trump's Mar-a-Lago advisors. This is extremely important and will really help uh, stop VA privatization, perhaps, we hope. And Democrats who, come, who are coming into Congress, the new cohort, need to really get a better understanding of the Veterans Health Administration and look beyond the headlines to the reality and the studies that show what a great system it is. 
And, and I will just conclude by saying that, uh, and Democrats who voted for this uh, and who consistently vote on the side of privatization, in this case, letting down our veterans to do this, ought to be held accountable. Um, so I guess we'll have to leave it there because we are out of time. But Suzanne Gordon, author of Wounds of War, How the VA Delivers Health, Healing, and Hope to the Nation's Veterans, and co-author of the recent piece in the American Prospect on Trump's push to dismantle veterans' health care. Thanks for reporting on this, and thanks for coming on the program. Thank you so much, Richard. It's been